We're going to take some questions from the floor. And the lovely Fiona, roll up your hand uh, for the mic. Uh, she'll be going around with a roving mic. Um, for, for those of you who would like to be uh, accosted by the last of the roving mic, please put up your hand and uh, we'll take your questions. So anyone interested in the question? 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 Anyone have an answer? <laughs> This is a question for Sarah. Um, are there any methods that are possible to use to try and stop this uh, honeybee mite from coming to Australia? Well, the, Australia already has some of the most strict quarantine regulations, so that is one of the key things. Uh, the difficulty is twofold. One is that the mite is, or well, a variant of the mite is found in Papua New Guinea already. So, you know, that's not all that far from Australia. It could get in uh, on boats or easily that way. And unfortunately, there are some people who don't think about the consequences and who smuggle queen bees between countries. Uh, it is thought that's how it reached New Zealand, because Varroa mite is in New Zealand. So unfortunately, it is likely to get in through human action. So turning back the boats is not going to help. Sorry? <laughs> no. So, uh, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, we're surrounded, aren't we? Yeah, yes. But isn't there, I was under the impression that there, that there was actually quite a lot of biodiversity when it came to bees in Australia. So we have actually quite a, a diverse range of bees. Is it possible that some of them might not react to this mite? Might not, you know, before? Oh, they actually don't. The mite only attacks the honeybee. It won't attack the native bees, and it doesn't attack bumblebees either. So can we, like, retrain the local bees to, you know, <laughs> doing the job? They'll probably help, yes. They probably will help. Uh, but unfortunately, going back to something I said earlier, none of the native bees work in the... produce the large colonies with the volume of workers that you need for pollination. So they could certainly help. Uh, some of the things like the blue banded bee, the native stingless bees. I think you can actually buy hives of stingless bees to keep in your garden. It's great. They're stingless. You know, you don't even need special training to handle them. Wow. But uh, yeah, they just don't prov provide the volume of pollination. Uh, any other questions? I think we had a question over there, from this gentleman. Thank you. So, hi. If, uh, if you had um, unlimited resources to preserve um, biodiversity around the world, what, what areas of greatest need are there that you would, you would concentrate on around, around the world? Uh, it's a good question. Um, we've identified about global hotspots. These are places that are full of diversity and also have a high level of threat. And there's um, some evidence that shows if you protected those 25 global um, biodiversity hotspots, this is for terrestrial biodiversity, so that's not including marine things, you could conserve well over about, I think, 70 or 80 percent of the world's biodiversity by looking after about 1.4 percent of the world's surface. So it's pretty simple. You find those areas and you basically um, ameliorate the threats, which is essentially stop clearing. From, a, from an Australian perspective, if you wanted an answer to all the biodiversity issues we've got, it's a really simple question. It's a simple answer. It's simply stop clearing vegetation, stop destroying habitat, and you would stop um, the rate of biodiversity loss almost immediately. We could worry about foxes, invasive species, all the other sorts of things that we were concerned about, but the rate of habitat degradation is the fundamental driver of biodiversity loss. And if you, once you accept that, and you realise that a lot of biodiversity is concentrated in places like um, the tropics in particular, and, and islands as well, yeah, you can, it's a pretty easy solution, to be honest. So. Do you know where the hotspots are? Would you be able to name the hotspots in Australia? Uh, in Australia, you've got Southwest WA, primarily for its vegetation. It's got a unique collection of flora that's um, highly diverse. Um, and there's, there are a few different ways of sorting it out, but also um, parts of um, the Daintree, parts of um, far north Queensland are also important. So you'd be looking primarily, if you're looking at trying to get more bang for your buck with respect to species, you'd be looking at um, conserving say, places like Southwest, Western Australia and far north Queensland. But, Biodiversity is a little bit more than that, so if you're looking at trying to convert, conserve diversity across its range, because it, you wouldn't be quite so, um, I suppose, focusing on such a numerate response. You'd be realising that parts of Tasmania are important, parts of New South Wales, all those sorts of things, but the simple answer is stop clearing, yeah. and stop clearing those, 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 those places with lots of special things. Thank you.
we have another question? Yes, we do. I was wondering how Australia fares in comparison to the rest of the world in terms of the range of biodiversity loss. We're the champions. Um, we lost more species than any other country in the planet, so... Yeah. Aussie, Australia. Aussie, Aussie. Yeah, um, Aussie, Even Aussie. more than New Zealand? Yeah, well, in terms of documented extinctions, which is thing, people, things people haven't seen for 50 years, we've lost, we've managed to get rid of many of our um, native mammals at a phenomenal rate. Having said that, the mammals are only a very small part of the story. Most of the things that are going extinct with respect to this global biodiversity crisis are things that um, don't have names and no one's ever seen. They're things that we're predicting are going extinct through the rates of um, deforestation in parts of the world that simply haven't been studied. So when we talk about losing X number of species per day, we're talking about the loss of things that we are, think and are fairly confident were there and now currently lost. So in short answer, Australia is very good at losing its native species. There are other parts of the world that are probably catching up. In terms of documented, guaranteed extinctions, we're the best. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Just grab Fiona. Well, sorry, Max, let me rephrase that. Uh, make yourself, uh, make yourself known. Make yourself known to Fiona. Hello there, panel. Um, <laughs> I heard a new word today, which was biophony, and um, there's this guy called Bernie. I can't remember his surname, but he's famous. And uh, he goes out into the landscape and records sound. And he has a theory that human music may actually, I heard it on Robin Williams' science show, so we probably all heard it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But he was, this guy Bernie was suggesting that music in humans has potentially evolved from um, us interacting with the biophony. So the sounds of crickets, the sounds of frogs chirping at night time and you know, primitive people may have got together and played along to these sounds. I'm wondering if the entomologists in particular can think of some interesting sounds that animals might have made, which could have led to the evolution of, of music. I mean, that's certainly something that animals have given to us, if Bernie's correct. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lot. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool insect sounds in particular. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon cicadas would be one, one option, but I mean, in terms of musical sound, I would have thought birds might have been a greater inspiration to humans, perhaps, than insects. I mean, particularly since some of the birds can mimic as well, can mimic sounds. And Justin Bieber got his, his inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Brendan, say it. Justin Bieber got his ins that inspiration. Yeah, it's okay, there you go. Uh, also, also, Whitney Houston in that song. Anyway, <laughs> it's a bit there. Um, do we have any other questions before we go back to our session? Are you dying to ask a question? No, you're not. Okay, going, going back into our discussion, um, surely there must be, I, I know Dita, you were kind of keen on the idea that um, some species may not be needed. Surely bed bugs would be amongst those species, Dita. Uh, well, the question of whether they're needed, they're probably good for, for, for pest exterminators. But bed bugs came out. Okay, so there's, there's, all, there's jobs of removing them. Of course, I hadn't thought of that. There's a whole industry there. Well, perhaps we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll go back to bed bugs afterwards if it's okay, Wilson, because we'll, they do some interesting things sexually. But one of the things we talk about with respect to what animals have done for us is one of the things we didn't talk about is what animals do to us. Like, I mean, when we think about the most dangerous animal on the planet, most people think of sharks big cats, bears, but mosquitoes kill about 2 million people a year, so yeah. one of the things that's really important is to realise that animals do a lot of stuff to us too, so with respect to them being perhaps useful, some of them are particularly um, deteriorating, but with respect to bed bugs in particular, one of the things that they do is they provide us with a, a role model of what not to do essentially, they practice an act called um, traumatic insemination and it's basically the males have decided to inseminate the females through the body cavity rather than the, um, the genitals. And it's really that, that don't try this at home sort of sphere of things. So basically it's a way of ensuring paternity. There's some fascinating stories about males inseminating other males who actually pass on their rapist sperms onto the female. But essentially... Whoa! <laughs> well, yeah. Whoa! Let's go on! Please go on! Yeah. 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 So I think, I think the point with the bedbugs, what, what, what do they actually do? They're, they're pretty much, they're things that have actually adapted to our environment. They really have 
seen that build our hotels, build our backpackers' lounges, and they've made a killing, basically. Not literally like some of the other insects that we can talk to you about the brick. But you're right, they, they, they actually, um, the, they inseminate through piercing the carapace, yeah. don't they? It's the structure of, yeah, into the, the... Yeah, the ADHist, or the, 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 the penis analogue, is basically a great big sort of sword-like thing, and they basically just slice in through the side of the female. Oh, don't don't care. <laughs> no chocolates or flowers, really. It's just... It's just straight they're, they're probably in a rough, Brendan. Um, Look, essentially, it's, and the females often have these little adaptations to stop. They've got the little little hard bits, basically, to try and guide it into the right spot. Like it's armor. Like, well, it's tr trying to provide a, a target, basically, that's not going to yeah. hurt you. So it's all, and it's, it's, it's sort of it's what works. Proof. It's quite, a, it's evolved many times in the in the, um, the bugs. So um, no, I'm not, not judging, but I'm just saying that some. Um, <laughs> There's a whole it, topic. We actually so. we actually did a series a movie in, in Cosmos about uh, the weird sex that happens in the animal world. It's some stuff that would just curl your hair. Um, you just wouldn't believe. And I didn't know about bed bugs, though. That, that's really thrown me. So not only do they suck your blood, they also rape and pillage. Okay, great. No, wonderful species. But you're saying that the only value to humanity is that they keep uh, pest exterminators um, um, employed. Which I don't think is a good enough reason to keep them. So I can, let's put them on the list of, you know, no need, not required. Are there other species we can put on the list of not required? I'd say most lizards don't do a great job. I like lizards. <laughs> well, you know, they basically just hang around under rocks, get warm and eat bugs. Um, they look so good. When it, when it's, you're saying not required. I'm saying that they're not useful. And I think one of the things that's important is that we talk about these species with their, their utilitarian value, that these things are providing some sort of a service. And I think overwhelmingly, when people ask me, in nature, are these things useful? A lot of them aren't particularly useful, but that doesn't actually mean that you want to get rid of them. I think mm. I mentioned art and music earlier on as not being particularly useful. I don't think they are particularly useful, but they do enrich our lives, and that's the same way that a lot of species do. You'll find that people engage with nature, enjoy nature. I'd never want to get rid of all the the art and music and all that, the same way I don't want to get rid of the diversity in the world. I mean, I think it's a real flaw when we actually mm. hang our hat and saying, these species are all useful, let's keep them, because I can pretty much guarantee a lot of them, I'd be terribly sad if we lost them, but they don't do things that are genuinely useful. And I think it's a really important distinction, and I, and I still, I mean, if you want to keep useful things, you wouldn't keep old people. Uh, well, I mean, Kids, they're a drain on income and resources and time. My three are. Um, yeah. Um, but it's true. I mean, it's a valid point. point. The, the problem with the paradigm of today is that everything has to have economic benefit. And uh, I remember a discussion that I ha had with a series of people about this very thing. And one of them said, well, an economist was saying, well, you know, um, everything's got to have a value. And uh, an ecologist was saying, well, what's the value for penguins? I mean, what, what is the, they look fantastic and everyone loves them and wants to see them and wants to, films are made about them, but what's the value of penguins? And the economist said, I don't know, if, if they have some intrinsic value, like you can make gloves out of them, then, then that makes sense. And that's the problem with that paradigm, isn't it? If it ain't useful for us, we can't make a buck out of it, it has no use. But that's not how the, that's well, not how ecology works. What's the definition of useful? Useful is definition. What we're saying is defining, is it useful to us? Mm. But obviously, us as humans haven't been around for that long and I'm sure the lizard or the penguin were quite happy with their existence, not assuming that they had a role in our existence, if you know what I mean. So it's turning it around the other way. Saying, yeah, let's flip it. Let's what, say, what, what are we doing? What are we exactly. doing for the penguin? What are we doing? How useful are we for the penguins? So, I mean, you could argue that the, without the human race, probably the rest of the world would actually survive quite well. There you so, go. So, I'm, right. I'm, not, I'm not advocating a mass extinction of humans, of course. But I think we can look at this thing through a different different angle. That we don't have to look at use in terms of our own race and, or species or whatever, and biotechnology, etc. That things have been around for a long time and not just to so ultimately not, they are not useful. Just to help us. Exactly. They are useful, but beyond us. However, you know, talking about removing humans, if we remove humans, your particular patch, Sarah, agriculture, there's a whole range of species that kind of rely completely on us, don't they? Well. Yes, but on the other hand, their, their native sort of ancestors in many cases are still around and if you only have to look at feral animals, feral pigs, horses, many, many of our domesticated animals could actually survive without us. Not perhaps the most pampered dogs and cats, but um, many of our domesticated animals could survive. But if it wasn't for us, 
cows would not be in this number of this number of, of creatures, and pigs wouldn't be in these sheep numbers. In and sheep, all the sheep in New Zealand. Can't forget that. Yeah, not as many sheep as there used to be, but that, that's true. They wouldn't be present in the numbers, but they wouldn't be extinct. So, is it? Do you think that, from a biological perspective, it's actually a successful engagement they've had with humanity, and that it has advantaged their numbers? You know, the, if if success is measured by numbers, is that how would one su su uh, measure success in a biological sense? That hey, we must be successful because we've got so many, but then is it, are they all exactly the same? Are there, is there a monoculture of, of sheep versus diversity of sheep? Well, that, that is something that's becoming more into question um, in terms of animals and, and livestock and, and also our food crops. Uh, there's a tendency to focus in on a very small number or a very small genetic variety uh, and that can be a disadvantage if you develop, if or if a disease or some other problem develops and all your, all your organisms, all your domestic organisms are the same genetic makeup, then they're all going to be susceptible. Uh, and uh, an example right now that's very much in the news is the problem with merino sheep and the need for mulesing because merino sheep are much more vulnerable to fly strike. Now people say mulesing is terrible, it's painful. Well, I'll tell you, it's a, hell of a lot, it's a hell of a lot more painful to be a sheep with serious fly strike out in the outback and you're having your body eaten alive by maggots. That's a lot worse than the mulesing process. Can we describe what mulesing actually is for those of us who uh, Yes, for those of you who, don't, who haven't um, heard a bit about this, what they actually do, flies tend to congregate around the back end of the sheep um, particularly where the skin has kind of folds and moisture collects. So what they do in mulesing is they actually trim away the excess flesh and make it a smooth area. So it's a surgical procedure to smooth out those areas and it's reduce... cosmetic surgery. Yeah, it is. It's cosmetic surgery for sheep. That um, the reason you have many more of those folds on the merino is it's to do with it actually affects the wool production. That's how you get the very fine wool. But unfortunately, a side effect of that is uh, that they have more of these folds and they're more vulnerable to fly strike. So one of the things people are looking at in the long term is whether they can sort of change the breeding of the merino sheep so that you still get the nice fine wool, the good quality wool, but you can reduce that skin folding so that you can actually, through breeding, reduce the susceptibility to fly strike. Uh, and then you could potentially eliminate the need for mules. So are there other species that are kind of reliant on activity of humans to maintain them? Because it sounds like um, through breeding we've created kind of super creatures in a sense. Like apples originally were apparently this big and uh, bananas with little herbs are about this big. And we've, through it, human intervention, we've made them much, much larger. So in biological success terms, those, those um, creatures have taken off and they're, they're larger and they procreate more. Uh, but those are measured by the use to you and I as humans. Are there other um, bits of biodiversity that are completely reliant on us without, and without us would be difficult to, for them to survive? There is one example that I can think of that comes from the insect world and that's actually the silk moth. Uh, that there are wild ancestors to the silk moth but the one that we use to produce clothes it is completely and utterly domesticated to the point that it cannot survive without human help. Uh, the adults, they still have wings but they can't actually fly their, their wings have reduced and they just kind of flap away like this, but they don't actually move anywhere. The female, female moths are just big bags of eggs. You know, all they want to do is mate with the male and then immediately start pumping out lots of eggs. And the caterpillars are pretty stupid too. They, they don't even, you have to kind of present the food on a nice flat surface so they can just eat their mulberry leaves very easily. If they have to climb or do any work to get the food, they don't know how to do that anymore. So silk moths are actually completely dependent on humans now. Uh, if we stop producing silk, we, um, the, that species would die. But I, it's the only example I can think of that's completely... Pandas different. come to mind, but they don't produce silk, so pandas have no use, really. But they're just so incorrigibly cute, aren't they? Well, yeah, but they could probably, if we weren't busy, you know, changing the environment that they naturally live in, they could probably survive. But you, but you, you brought up, in, in speaking about agriculture, you, you bring up a very, very valid point, and that is that um, we are somewhat reliant on a very small number of species, are we not? And um, that has its drawbacks. Uh, currently, we're going back through um, 
wheat rust. Wheat, wheat rust is coming out. We're all reliant on wheat. Everyone eats bread. There's, there's, there's wheat in everything, um, like in soya and everything. But um, wheat is down to very, very few number of species, aren't they, globally? Because these are successful species. And if a disease comes along like wheat rust is apparently coming back, it's knocking out um, wheat crops all over the planet. So this is quite a, a risk for us, isn't it, as a species? Yes, it, it, that, that's definitely a serious risk, and it's something scientists have been concerned about for some time. The wheat rust example in particular, they are very concerned about it. Uh, the, rust the rust strain that's evolved, which can attack what have been previously resistant varieties of wheat is present in uh, part of Africa. And people are very concerned about the potential spread of that because you could re see a situation similar to the Irish potato famine, where basically all your varieties are susceptible to that disease. Uh, but worldwide, there are special institutes for all our major crops that hold germplasm of many different ancestral varieties, and they use those to try and search for solutions to problems like this. So there's an institute in Peru for potato, uh, there's one for corn or maize in Mexico. I can't quite remember where, there, there is one for wheat, but I've forgotten which country it's in. Uh, and so there are institutes dedicated to maintaining that genetic variety and trying to use that. But commercially, yes, we're very limited in what we do and what we rely on. So it's interesting, we're starting to come back, instead of what have animals ever done for us, we're starting to come back to the fact, and ultimately saying what's the point of biodiversity, we're all coming back to the fact that actually not having biodiversity is making it a little bit risky for us, isn't it? Definitely. When it comes to our food groups, we're reliant on so, such little diversity in, in life. Is the, is the same, not, it's not the same in microbiology though, because you, you, can't, you can't remove the bugs, you can't rely on a monoculture of bugs. Or do we do that? You mentioned beer, we make beer. Are we only using certain bugs for beer and ignoring everything else? Or? Well, there are certain, there are certain species or, or strains of, of yeast, basically, that are better at fermenting the different processes for making beer. Um, and this comes back to the, the point of economics, that you get ones that are the, the most efficient at doing this process, whether it be making beer or making bread or whatever. So in, in that sense, I guess we are selecting for those certain organisms to do a service, if you like, for us. Um, but you can also look at other, you know, I guess, and this, this comes, this is a whole new topic of conversation, if you look at genetic engineering and things like that, where you're looking at perhaps microorganisms, where they're looking at trying to, microorganisms that can, that can adapt to high salt or high drought, for instance, and looking at using their features to help make crops more salt resistant. Or it's kind of resistant. adding diversity, exactly. but it's so, very specific about it. I want this sort of element of, or this sort of power. Exactly. And I want to add that. And, and, and add there's, that the there's pluses and minuses against that, I guess. And, you, and you, you, know, you have to be careful about what you're doing, but you can be at least... Where do you sit on a tree, Brennan? I'm somewhere, I tend to kind of teeter on the fence, I guess. But I, I know... Just I, like a scientist. Yeah, no. No, I think... I think I, as always, I think there's, if, if you're doing it for the right ways, if we do what we do for good and not evil, <laughs> then I think, it's, then I think we, we, we're doing the right thing. So. When you say that, you're going to do the evil scientist laugh? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. It shows that you're actually being quite Do cynical. Dr. Evil. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dieter, can you do an evil scientist laugh? <laughs> just, just wondering. You look like the sort of guy that could do a Dr. Evil kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, there you can. Uh, it looks like the sort of guy who could. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, you, want to, you said you want to talk about bed bugs again. Is that now, or is you already covered that oh, topic? I, just mentioned, I like saying traumatic insemination in public. That's, that's like, yeah, um, well, he talked about and blind, blind genitals. I mean, really? Uh, um, actually, one of the things I would like to talk about is we talk about what animals do for us. One of the things we didn't talk about is what animals do for each other. Um, when you, you think about beavers, what do you think about? <laughs> We're not taking questions on this yeah. one. <laughs> these, these animals no pictures. fundamentally change their environment. They're ecosystem engineers that basically create a world for a whole bunch of animals and plants to live in. That, are, that If we lost that single species, we'd lose dozens of other species. If we lose beavers who are doing their clear cutting and dam building, we'd lose dozens of freshwater, North American freshwater um, flora and fauna. And one of the things we don't realise is just how important animals are and actually structuring their environments, actually changing their environments and making them suitable for um, other animals and plants to live in. So when we talk about what animals have done for us, I think what we also realise is some of those services actually go to um, sort of creating that rich tapestry of nature too. So 
Um, I know the question was about what animals have done for us. No, no, it's a valid, it's valid. Animals do a lot of stuff for other animals It's valid, and I don't think anybody... Web of life, exactly. Everything's interconnected. I don't think anyone's arguing to remove beavers, because that would just be (laughs) not on. But um, uh, what's interesting is um, uh, these are what's known as a number of them that are known as keystone species, aren't they? Is that the correct term? Yeah, yeah, keystone species are essentially species that um, play a a disproportionate role in structuring ecosystems compared to their their abundance. So... um, Good examples are top predators, where if you lose that top predators, you lose the regulation of the things that are eating them. So basically, a single species, which isn't necessarily super abundant, plays a disproportionately important role. It's like it's meant to be like the keystone in an arch. It's the arch, little stone right up the top that basically holds the arch together. And if you take that one, the whole thing falls yeah. apart. Yeah, it's actually intriguing. So, are there many of these keystone species, and should the if you're worried about that biodiversity, which apparently we should be, um, should we be focusing rather than hotspots, which is an issue about numbers. It's kind of like finding Hong Kong apartments where lots of species live together very closely. So that's an issue about the um, number of species. Should we be focusing on whether they're keystone species? I, I think one of the interesting things about biodiversity is um, for an overwhelming majority of species on the planet, all we know about them is um, what they look like, what their names are, and where they were caught. We know very little about what they actually do. We, we can probably look at, in, in terms of the the millions of species on the planet, we probably only have a good understanding maybe of about a, a thousand or so of those. So the question about how many keystone species are there probably could be spread a little bit more broadly. We still know relatively little about what an overwhelming majority of the planet actually does for a living and how, how they impact upon us. So I think we're looking at trying to find priorities for future work. We're looking at trying to actually not so much necessarily name all our species but find out what they actually do. So Dieter's is actually arguing for you know a massive increase in the number of uh, biologists, entomologists... Basically, more people like you to go out and find them. There you go. More government funding. There you go. Well, it doesn't have to be government, you see. If, if, if you're a business these days, you need ecological services. You need to rely on ecological services. So let's t- turn to economics, though. We, we have kind of skirted around the issue of, you know, whether something is um, valid for, um, for us, therefore it has economic value, and that's how we measure it. Um, should we actually start including the value of the bees who are doing all this unpaid work for us? Um, what do you pay a bee, though, if you're going to do an economic model? What's the, the hourly rate of the bee, do you think? And, and is a worker bee versus queen bee? Does queen bee get bonuses based on delivery? No? Well, I don't know if anyone's actually looked at it from the point of view of the actual bees, but in terms of the apiarists, the people who keep bees, uh, that's definitely a cost. You do have to pay for them. Uh, and there are es- estimates of the costs for that uh, that people have started to work out because of the problems with varroa mite, when you suddenly have to start relying entirely on beekeepers, then it is millions upon millions of dollars per year uh, that farmers will have to pay for pollination because they will have to actually pay for the bees to be brought onto their farm. And much of that service right now is free because there are feral bee colonies out in the wild that do the service for nothing. But, yeah, I couldn't give you a number of per bee. You were quoting numbers before about the, the billions of dollars, how much the industry, well, the industry, sorry, it's calling the industry, <laughs> the work of bees is uh, if you remove them and you have to replicate that work, what it would cost. And that's probably a useful guide, isn't it, to a discussion to say, hey, but if we started factoring, factoring that in, um, gosh, it would be exorbitantly expensive to produce bread or or uh, things we take for granted. I'm not talking honey, honey is very nice, but you're talking way yes. beyond honey. Yes, uh, if you have to pay for commercial pollination services, it will feed into food prices. Food prices will definitely rise because, uh, well, food prices are either going to rise and all food supply is going to decline because there's not going to be as much food produced if you don't have the pollination to produce the food. And that's where the energy modified food comes in. It also contributes to weight loss because you won't because you don't have as much food to eat. There you go, yes, solution for the obesity problem. <laughs> All right. Um, last, last bit of uh, contribution to the animal world is um, where would we be in medical research without um, you know, the input of things like, I don't know, um, penicillin, you know, nasty old mould, apparently had something to do with, um, with uh, creating the antibiotic age. Absolutely. That, that kind of kick-started everything from this... Humble little bacterium and producing 
producing what has been one of the major drugs of the of, of the last century anyway. I think it's been and saved billions of people. Absolutely. And this is continuing on with, as I said before, microorganisms or bacteria are the main factories for producing drugs that we that we know of. And without them we'd be we'd be stuck because So you say drugs you mean like everything from what paracetamol to Viagra? Well, there, there's a, and then there's, yes, there is in fact, and there's a whole industry of not only utilising the drugs that microorganisms can produce naturally, but also exploiting that, and it's what something we call combinatorial biochemistry, so where you're getting a drug that a, a bacteria produces and you're manipulating that to produce an even better one. This is again coming down to economics and efficiency of a drug, so you can actually make a drug that a bacterium produced, which is pretty good, and make it a little bit better because the delivery system is better or its efficacy is a little bit better. That's what the pharmaceutical so, industry spent a lot of time doing. Exactly. Finding out what happened, what's happening in the microbial world and trying to replicate it and enhance it, which is kind of what we do exactly. in agriculture, isn't it? Find it's happening in the real world and yeah. make it bigger. Banana from this yeah. to this. Yeah, make it bigger, make it better, twist it, you know, change it in a way that it's better adapted to. But couldn't they remove the bend from it, do you think? Or couldn't they make it sort of straight? Yeah. 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 No, that's good. It's good. All right, um, so medical research. Um, and should we be worried about uh, too much, too much of, the, um, of them resisting antibiotics? Because you were saying that the more antibiotics we hand out, the, the, they actually evolve resistance to it. So is that something to be worried about too? Well, if, you, if in terms of getting some of the major um, resistant strains of, of bacteria or microorganisms, you actually find in a hospital. And that's because the, the hospitals are, are, are... But you guys need to get better. Yeah, but ironically, that's in fact where a lot of people get sick, particularly after an operation, they actually can get sick because of they're either immunocompromised or because a hospital is, is, is just a hunting ground for microorganisms that have adapted to all the antibiotics we're throwing at them. But also, I guess, because people coming into hospital and they're ill in the first place, they're carrying a whole bunch of stuff. Exactly. So you then have these super microorganisms, these different forms of E. coli that we've seen, etc. And when you're in hospital, you're often a little bit more um, compromised in terms of your health anyway. So it, it is a bit of a catch-22. The more antibiotics we're throwing into our systems, supposedly to make ourselves better, we're also contributing to making certain microorganisms a lot nastier because they can then become resistant to all these things. And eventually, if everything that we're throwing at them, there's one super bug or virus that is resistant to that. Then we're in a bit of strife, so. Why can't these species just, you know, cooperate and do what we need them to do? And it's, it's almost as if we're like animals ourselves. We're going to take um, a last lot of questions uh, before we start doing the prize draw and, and do a wrap up. Um, by the way, if you, every time you ask a question, you get a, a free copy of this, so um, as an incentive. And you get to talk to, to Fiona, which is, should be in itself as an incentive. I'm going to hand over the mic so that and if you have a question, uh, please indicate to Fiona and att attract her attention. Well, I was wondering, do you think that cockroaches are a useful function for humans? Well, I, w I wouldn't, I don't personally like them in my kitchen, but actually in the urban environment, if you think about the amount of sort of food waste and other rubbish that gets dropped, cockroaches and some of the other things that you get around the house, they're actually contributing to removing that waste in the urban environment. Uh, so it is a function. Uh, but I agree. Uh, in, in your actual house, in your kitchen, you probably don't want them. Can I follow up on the cockroaches? There's actually enormous numbers of species of cockroaches. The American and the German cockroaches that are in our kitchens are probably, as Sarah said, aren't that likeable. But um, the giant burrowing cockroaches we have in Australia, the Panacea, they're really big, beautiful animals are about this big. They're very clean. They love, they're basically dead leaves. They're fantastic apartment pests. If you live anywhere within about two or three kilometres of here, they're the only pets you'll be able to keep in your apartment. And they, I've seen them in, um, enrich kids' lives, enrich people's lives. So yeah, I mean, so they can. Cockroaches can be useful. Depends on which species. There's you know, hundreds of species. So these really big, bur uh, beautiful burrowing ones definitely do. Not so much the ones I think you're alluding to. Yeah. And actually those burrowing cockroaches, quite a number of them are social. They have to live in small groups, otherwise they die of loneliness. Wow. <laughs> any other species that people want to ask about, that whether they actually serve a function? Or any other question you may have? Yeah, I got a question. Sir. 
Hey, um, Doc Hot, you were saying um, <laughs> um, early on that if we wiped out all the mammals, then we'd probably be fine. They don't really contribute to, you know, the ongoing uh, life on our planet. I mean, we'd probably feel bad, like, if we burned down the Smithsonian or something. Um, uh, but in, in a lot of, um, I guess, biodiversity protection stuff in, in, in Australia, we spend a lot of time focusing on those charismatic, you know, uh, uh, bigger end mammals and not on those uh, hard workers like the bees and stuff. Do you think there's something a little bit, re well, not retarded, that's a bad word. <laughs> a little bit redonkulous about um, <coughs> spending so much money to protect Tasmanian devils while still clear cutting old growth forest? Uh, at a personal level, yes, because I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my interests are primarily insects and a lot of the other groups are associated with them. Um, the reality with conservation is there's a political imperative. Um, an overwhelming majority of the community prefer those bigger, more charismatic animals for very good reasons. I personally, if you ask me what my favourite animals in the world are, are still probably pandas and dolphins. It's pretty much still up there. But, um, you know, the, the, the reason we invest so heavily in those is they're recognisable. Culturally, that's how we've managed the environment in the past. We've found something at risk and we've identified a way of trying to manage it. I, I think one of the beauties of considering biodiversity and the popularity of biodiversity in the last um, 20 years or so is people are considering systems and considering everything in those systems. Um, and it probably reflects the fact I can go into a, a class full of seven or eight year olds and they will be totally enthused and engaged with insects and the like. I get a group of 19 year olds in my second year university entomology class and I ask them the same, they ask the same questions as my seven-year-olds. They're about at the same sorts of levels. And something goes horribly wrong where at eight we're absolutely enthralled by the small things in nature. By 18 or 20, we've lost sight of that. It gets worse as we get a little bit older. I think we're missing out terribly by not engaging with insects. It's like if you chose to just listen to Justin Bieber all night instead of other types of music. Not no disrespect to Justin Bieber, he's got a terrific song but a lovely haircut, but I think there's a whole lot of other things out there that really will enrich your life just as much as he does. And it's, so, what I'm, so, so what I'm saying is that there's, yeah, the short answer is yes, I think we, 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 we don't have our values in the right place. It's partly because we don't understand how important some of these other things are. It's partially because we just don't understand those things. And a lot of people don't like creepy crawlies, that's the reality. You know, I, I don't like a lot of things, but I really, really don't know. sometimes the things I don't like can actually be quite good for me too. I've learned to embrace rugby league and rugby union now that I've moved to Sydney. So, um, <laughs> On that note, what animals have done to us? No one liked magpies this weekend. Okay? Yeah. We really have to hate magpies this weekend. Yeah. Uh, any questions around the back there? Uh, I have a question. Um, we've been talking about biodiversity tonight with biologists and entomologists and agriculturalists and uh, we've been discussing a lot about the value of the honeybee with pollination and the effect of biodiversity on agriculture and possibly human health. Just for a moment to look at this idea from a completely different angle, is there a reason why we can't you know engineer little robots or something to do all of this for us? Like is there a reason why we need nature? To do it? <laughs> Please don't punch me. You guys have it. You guys have it. Forget this one. Probably the same reason that sex dolls haven't taken off. It's just, it's, it's, it's just not the same. No. <laughs> interesting question. I mean, one of the things, it probably works the other way around. People look at a lot of groups and basically just um, look at insects and the like, and they use them, but they've got very simple nervous systems. They work through a simple set of rules. They're good models for actually trying to improve robots. So actually, people that are building robots are looking to nature and say, how can we build a better robot? Um, basically, because these animals work on very, very simple decision-making principles, and they make exceptionally good decisions, everything from how best to organise traffic with respect to ants, or how to move using a very simple static exoskeleton. So could you make robot? I think basically nature's had a lot of time to basically um, trial and error. And if you, if you were in error, you died out. So basically- Engineers these... have every Friday night though. Is that not enough? Well, engineers- well, Probably have... they forget what they talk about Saturday morning. Because so the engineers have a very short Friday night. They've got about from five till seven. Every engineer I know is pretty much not particularly useful. I mean, they're, they're a lot of fun. They're very useful after about seven, seven. And it's 
it's restricted by when the happy hour finishes. You're really hitting it on the engineers now. Yeah. The sex toy is just fantastic. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to point Doc gems. Hawk towards SBS, <laughs> where apparently sex dolls are incredibly useful. Just point them. Uh, Fiona, can you take the mic off that leg? <laughs> I was going to say as well, though, uh, if we could make robot reproduce, perhaps that would be good. But we have to keep making more. And more. <laughs> metal on metal action. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Too many sparks flying there. Too many sparks. Oh. oh. <laughs> Uh, any, any last questions before we get into robot on robot action? No, we're, we're kind of done. Oh, we have one last question. Yeah. About bees. Um, my father, when he was when he turned fifty-five, he has uh, rheumatic arthritis, and then he read a book about. Uh, therapy by using uh, honeybee. So he injected himself with honeybees into his legs for about six months or so, and then he totally cured. He doesn't have that anymore. And then lately, because uh, I have a friend who has that problem, and then I actually Googled it, and there are actually some people written about that. You mean like the sting? The yeah, the sting himself, yeah, with honeybees. So I'm not sure if you've heard about that yet. And I so that's something interesting, maybe if you never heard. Uh, now, what I've been really curious is, I have similar question to that lady before about, uh, uh, about cockroaches, but I have a question about flies. Because in Australia, we have so, so many flies. So is that actually <laughs> any useful for the environment or not? Uh, Thanks. Yes, well, again, flies do contribute to waste disposal and, and uh, dung removal, in fact, although unfortunately that produces more flies as well. But um, actually it ties in with this issue of antibiotic resistance. Something that people have started returning to medically uh, is the use of maggots, fly maggots, to deal with wounds. And it's uh, being used more and more, particularly to deal with some of these very antibiotic resistant and flesh-eating bacteria that we have no other means of controlling. You can produce sterile maggots uh, that feed only on the rotting flesh, and they clean the wounds up. Good pets as well. So, so yes, they do very definitely have a function. I don't know about your sting, but um, uh, the, the sting therapy that you're talking about, but um, there have been examples in, in biology, haven't there, where something that is normally a poison or has a negative impact at lower doses actually has a positive impact. Uh, unfortunately, the only example that comes to mind immediately is Botox, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Which is usually deadly, but at low doses, you know, uh, smooths your face. Other examples you guys can think of where something is normally poisonous actually has a beneficial impact? A lot of the flavours in food come from the secondary compounds they produce. So, I mean, I think a lot of the people would argue that chilies produce some of their... Um, I mean, chilies aren't a great example because sometimes they can hurt, but basically they're often there to try and attract to stop the wrong types of insects just eating them. Yeah, so and it probably gets to a point that was being raised um, by the previous question that one of the things we didn't talk about was bioprospecting as a way of really trying to look at the value in, in biodiversity. There's probably a wealth of compounds out there that may be you know, the golden bullets for cancer and all that kind of thing, but essentially um, we just don't know where they are. And it's one of the reasons we may want to keep some of these things around. I I'm sure most things won't be particularly useful, but there will be one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand species that will have that compound that does you know, produce those magic cures. Because I mean, the thing, people, we often look at nature and talk about a balance in a web, but essentially it's an incredibly brutal world. It's full of things trying to eat each other, trying to kill each other, trying to avoid being eaten. And there's all sorts of fascinating ways things have come up to try and avoid. I think your, your microbes are a great example of that. And I think um, in terms of the usefulness, I think that's probably one of the things that we just don't realise. We don't know how useful many of these things really are going to be. So those things that are produced to try and stop an insect eating you may be the compounds that actually are there to... Say things. Oh, look, it's a valid point, but um, uh, we, you were making a point that we only really understand a few thousand organisms with any great clarity. Um, and if there are millions of organisms, and there, we're not even talking the microbiological world, <laughs> there's millions upon millions, and uh, 
which might be billions and billions uh, within that. And if we don't understand them, how can possibly we know that they have no value if we have next to no understanding of it? So um, I think we've arrived at a point um, tonight from our discussion that it's clear that... Um, was there one other question? No, no there isn't. It, uh, it, I think we've arrived at a point... I'll switch to my other microphone now. I think we've arrived at a point where it's clear that um, animals do a great deal for us and we're rather, um, rather reliant on them, actually. And uh, they could be doing a lot more about for us if we only understood them, certainly on the microbiology level. Um, so that is a very interesting journey we've, we've taken. And, and, and during that journey, we've discussed everything from blow-up dolls to... Um, Flying genitalia and robot on robot action, which should, are just the ones that stayed in my mind. I don't know why, but um, no, I, I've learned a lot tonight. So, and bed bugs. I mean, how could we? What's that terminology? Traumatic insemination. Traumatic insemination. I, that will traumatically uh, trouble me for um, for quite a long time. Now, look, before we uh, wrap up tonight, we have, of course, the all important uh, door prize giveaway and the um, and the draw which I'm going to rely on my uh, colleague, the lovely Becky Crew, and her assistant, uh, Fiona McDonald, to come up for the draw. So we need the box. Have you, have you entered your answers, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, before you take the box away, let's make sure the people have entered their answers. Remember, if you've got your answer on the table, drop it into the box, because your chances are pretty high. <laughs> you're gonna win something. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if people walk away with several gifts. Tonight. Oh, one more. In the meantime, while we're doing that, can I just ask, from the microbiology world and the insect world, um, to name your five uh, most useful. So I would say, because you're an agriculture, must five most useful insects that you can think of, five most useful microorganisms, and five most. Um, Remember, not useful, but just intriguing. And in your case, it could be slightly kinky. Really weird, insects. So, Sarah, your five top most useful insects. No, sorry, insects, you think? Uh, well, one we've talked a lot about tonight, of course, the honeybee. I'd, I'd definitely be putting that well up there. Uh, I might be a little biased because I did my PhD on this one, but I'm going to say trichogramma which is a very small wasp that's used to control many pest caterpillars and it's the most widely used biological control agent worldwide so I'd, I'd put that in the top five. Now, there's so many species to choose from and it's hard to really think which ones I'd, I'd put in the top five. Uh, You're uh, your top two then. Yeah, top two. Top two. What about you? Uh, for microorganisms, I'd say something like cyanobacteria or blue-green algae because it basically produces most of the world's oxygen and produces a lot of these natural processes. Most of the world's oxygen? Yeah. Basically, it, there's a lot of cyanobacteria and this goes to your... I'm giving you a plug for your next one, which is Oceans, am I right? That's right, yes. Next, if you were the next get, uh, Club Cosmos is Oceans. That was a, um, that was a good segue. If, we were, if, we were, if we were... Forgetting about rainforest, no offense to terrestrial, but if we were to get rid of all the cyanobacteria in the oceans, most of the oxygen production would be gone. So, oh. so we rely very much on, on these guys. Uh, Thanks for stealing. Obviously, the next and I'm a little sad at the moment. My view is empty. But yeast, <laughs> yeast that'd be one. Yeast, of, okay, that'd be one of my next favourites. Um, and all those organisms that hang out in the garden. Okay, before we go to your favourites, um, if you came in and you haven't got a raffle ticket. Can you make sure that uh, Becky, uh, can you make sure that you, you make yourself known to Becky, who will make sure you have a raffle ticket, and if you convince her that you didn't have a raffle ticket, um, then she'll give you one, because so we're going to do a, a prize draw. So Becky, can you make yourself visible to people who have... Uh... Yes, okay. So Dita, your, uh, your top five, top two... Not, not, not so much a species, but I think social insects, the ants and the bees are a great example. These, these animals dominate the insect world, which dominates the world. They're um, a great example of how social organisation lets you rule these sorts of ecosystems. When you mean social insects, you don't mean like go out clubbing and stuff. Well, they might, but basically it's, it's ones where you've got designated workers, queens, soldiers, all those sorts oh, of social things. social hierarchy. It's primarily the ants, the bees, and even the termites kick it's in like there. It's the royal family. Same thing. 
<laughs> and I mean, they're, they're fantastic because I mean, the social organising helps them dominate resources. They're a great role model because all the workers are female, so it's, um, males just sit around and do nothing. Um, so, <laughs> so the queens are not. No, they're no, female too. No, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're. Wow. Um, yeah. So I said I like pandas and dolphins. I, I mean, what are, those are the sorts of things that really help you engage. One of the things that's really important is that learning to sort of like, like being outside and learning to actually um, like nature is such a big part of learning how to learn about it. So there's a program in the States called the No Child Left Inside program, which is really trying to make kids from the, the cities here to say... And so anything that helps Early someone America. like it, it could be reptiles. So, I mean, I basically... I mean, I pretty much like it all, but in terms of my favourites, I like the social insects, I like things like spiders that just do such amazingly tenacious things in our local environment. And, um, yeah, choosing, choosing five is just terribly difficult, so... True enough. Well, look, I'll tell you what, I'll leave it to you to choose then, instead of choosing five, choose the, um, the first winning uh, entry who has to have a correct answer uh, to the trivia question. Now, pull it out. Okay, that's the first one. Let's see if we got it right. Now, the answer, of course, was... To, to, should we ask the question again? Do you guys remember the question? It's about the remoras. Yes, that's right. ask the question again. So the question was... I'm going to look up my notes now. The question was... Um, uh, so where is it? It's about the relationship okay, between the remoras. The remora and fish and attaches to the side of a shark and feeds on scraps. Is this A, commensalism, B, parasitism... C, mutualism, or D, just plain wrong? And the answer is? The correct answer is commensalism, which was A. I think they're right. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Oh, unfortunately, the answer is mutualism, so that's incorrect. So I have to draw another one. It's so commensalism. It's commensalism. I think it's commensalism. There's no benefit to the shark. I think you'll... Is that correct? Yes. Yes. It's a plus yeah, it's and zero plus relationship, not a plus plus, so it's not a mutualism. I'm sorry, I, I think this guy's the expert. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. And, and, and I agree as well. Is there, is there a marine biologist in the room? That's okay. That's the sign. Is there a doctor, is there a doctor in the house? I'm going to pick the next one. So sorry, it, this is a game of skill, not a game of chance.